Asato ma sadgamaya Tamaso ma jyotirgamaya Mrityor ma mritam gamaya Avir avir maedhi Rudra yate dakshinang mukham te namam pahinityam Om lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Reach us through and through ourself and evermore protect us from ignorance by thy sweet compassionate face. The title this morning is Swami Vivekananda in San Francisco. And in order to lead into that subject, we should go back and describe a little bit, just review some of the events that led up to Swami Vivekananda's coming to San Francisco. And of course, we'll go back to the very beginning, to which gives us an idea of what his teacher, what his master, Sri Ramakrishna, what he felt or what he knew, what he had been foretold or what had been revealed to him about the nature of this disciple of his. And the way he described it later, his mind went to a very high realm, he used to say. His mind ascended from the mundane through the realm of forms, and there was a boundary, a luminous boundary, between the realm of forms and the realm of the formless. Now, you don't exactly know how to interpret that literally. How can there be boundary in the realm of the formless? But the, the, what he was describing should be understood in a deep uh, spiritual sense, not, uh, not uh, in a strictly physical uh, sense. What he was referring to was a realm beyond the normal area of our experience, a normal uh, scene that we are not all used to, in which things are determined by name and form and by name, form, and function. If you eliminate name, form, and function, can you have anything left? At this point, we feel, no, we can't have anything left. All that we know is characterized by name, form, and function in some sense, either in the visual realm or else in dreams, in whatever we think about, uh, always is related to these characteristics. Anyway, his mind went to a realm of that nature. And in that, in that realm, he found that realm of extreme purity, extreme holiness, extreme concentration, 
on reality, on infinity. In that realm, he saw seven sages who were the embodiments of that realm. And he went to one of these sages, mentally he saw himself going to one of these sages. And it is said that it, that probably was the, what one could say is the chief, the most uh, elevated, the most respected of these, uh, these sages in his vision and he put, and he had taken the form of a little child, and he clasped the uh, that sage who was engaged in meditation, absorbed in meditation. He clasped him around the uh, around the uh, arms, and he said to him, "You must come with me. I am going. You must come with me." Now. We need not worry about the exact physical description. The point is he went to an extraordinary, a realm of extraordinary spiritual radiance and spiritual realization. And one of the beings absorbed in that realm, at one with that realm, he prevailed upon that being to come down to earth. You must come, I am going down to earth. I'm going to that realm, you must come with me. And uh, after some time, this vision ceased, and then some more time passed. And one day, Sri Ramakrishna saw some indication. He said that my man has been born, that uh, individual has been born. And that was understood to be the great personality that became Swami Vivekananda. Now, uh, however we want to take this, literally, figuratively, or symbolically, uh, the point is this placed, or indicates the place that Swami Vivekananda had in the thinking of Sri Ramakrishna. Now, also throughout his meetings with uh, Swami Vivekananda, who was then called Narendra Nadatta, Sri Ramakrishna was always extremely deferential to him in the sense that he knew that he was the the being that would carry his message, that would carry his, that divine message throughout uh, the humanity. So that is as far as the background is concerned. But then uh, many events took place later. Uh, Swami Vivekananda's father, Narendra Nathata's father, passed away, left the family in extreme uh, penury, and uh, he uh, had no way he tried to. He had got certain uh, paid positions for some time, but nothing seemed to work out, and his family was in dire straits. And also within him burned the fire of spiritual knowledge, spiritual realization, and he knew he was not meant for the ordinary spiritual life. And uh, Sri Ramakrishna, he came to Sri Ramakrishna and said to him, you must help me, you must try to somehow uh, solve these physical problems so that he could devote himself entirely to that spiritual quest. And Sri Ramakrishna asked him to go. He said, I cannot grant such things, but you go to the temple and pray to the Divine Mother, and all this will be granted to you. But Sri Ramakrishna went to the temple three times, and he could not ask for anything ordinary. He could not ask for physical things. He could not ask for uh, things having to do with this world at all. He saw 
as a living reality. He saw that divine living reality in the temple and he all the limited things of this world completely vanished from his mind. Anyway, to make the matter uh, short, he did eventually, Sri Ramakrishna told him, all right, your family will not, at least not suffer from lack of basic necessities. Anyway, but that shows the, uh, you know, the background the, to, to the scene that we are going to uh, discuss, namely who Swami Vivekananda was when he came to the San Francisco area. Now, later on, Swami Vivekananda said that the Divine Mother at one time had actually given him that obligation to do her work, to perform the tasks that would eventually appear before him. I mean, that, that feeling had been very strongly felt by the Swami. Anyhow, Sri Ramakrishna passed away uh, in 1886, and the disciples that he left behind, uh, having instructed them and having put them in Swami Vivekananda's charge, they all, the uh, certain of them, 16 of them became uh, sannyasins, became monks and wandered all over India in the traditional way that monks have done for thousands of years, being absorbed in the search for the realization of God and wandering from one temple to another as wandering monks. Now, in the course of this, um, Swami Vivekananda, who was of a startlingly brilliant intellect and uh, enormously uh, influential personality, had impressed people all through his wanderings with his extraordinary capacity. So when it was announced that uh, there would be a grand universal parliament of religions in Chicago uh, in 1893, the idea gradually uh, took hold among some of the people in various parts of India, from Rajasthan to Tamil Nadu, uh, that Swami Vivekananda had visited, the uh, conviction grew that this Swami would be the perfect representative of Hinduism in that parliament, which, would, which was uh, declared to be a forum for all the religions of the world. But the Swami was not at all convinced that this, that he should agree to this, that he should come to the West. Uh, he was, his life of, as a sannyasin was entirely opposite to that trend of thought. But two things especially happened, three things actually. First of all, his disciples and followers in various places became very adamant, very convinced that he was the, the perfect representative to represent Hinduism at this grand universal parliament that was being planned. That was one thing. And actually they gave, they raised funds for uh, sending me on this journey which would not have been uh, very cheap. He had to travel across half the world by, uh, by boat and then uh, appear for several months he would be gone. He would have to be maintained, so a considerable amount of funding was required. 
they managed to gather that from by begging from door to door and, and begging whoever they could uh, approach. But the Swami was not at all convinced that this should be done and he told them, all right, whatever you have collected, give away to the poor and if it is the will of God that I should engage in this, that I should go to this parliament, then that money will come again. The disciples had so much faith and reverence for him that they gave away this, uh, what they had very carefully and painstakingly managed to raise. They gave it away to the poor as had been, as he had instructed, and they waited. Then two further things happened. One was that Swami Vivekananda himself had an experience in which he saw in a vision of Sri Ramakrishna backing away into the sea, standing on the edge on the seashore, Backing, backing into the sea and waving for him to come and follow him. That was a tremendously impressive uh, event that uh, Swami Vivekananda experienced, but that still wasn't enough to get him to agree to go. He, he said uh, he still had the hesitation whether this was real, whether this was an imagination, and so he wrote to the Holy Mother, Sri Sarada Devi, Sri Ramakrishna's consort, who was living at that time in Calcutta or in Jairambadi, in her home near, uh, 60 miles or so from Calcutta. Anyway, Swami Vivekananda wrote to her and expressing uh, the desire that these uh, disciples of his head uh, to send him to the West and uh, asking her opinion. And it, when she got the letter, immediately she thought, no, this is impossible. How can my Noren uh, go to these strange places? He, uh, he is not at all acquainted with these things. How can I allow my, my spiritual son to... Uh, proceed on this dangerous enterprise? No, she was, she felt she ought to say no. But then another strange thing happened. She saw in her own mind, she had a vision or an experience of being in the, uh, looking at the Dakshineshwar temple she saw the temple and she saw the bathing hut that is in front of the Dakshineshwar temple, uh, where people who uh, visit the temple can take bath in the Ganga, in the, in the river. She saw that ghat where people normally come down from the embankment into the river. And to her great astonishment, she, as in this vision of hers, she saw Sri Ramakrishna suddenly appear. Of course, Sri Ramakrishna had passed away uh, quite a bit earlier. But she saw in her vision, she saw Sri Ramakrishna come down those steps of the ghat and enter the river. And as he entered the river, his form actually melted into the river. And she was totally astounded by this. But then, even further, even more astounding, she saw Swami Vivekananda, a vision of Naren, Swami Vivekananda, her Naren, come running down those same steps, getting into the river into which Sri Ramakrishna's form had melted and become part of the river, and he saw Naren take handfuls of that water of the Ganga 
And suddenly there were many people around in her vision. She saw so many people around. Naren would take the water into which Sri Ramakrishna had actually, his form had actually melted into the water. And he sprayed that water over all these people standing on the, uh, who had appeared standing in, in, the, in the water, spraying the, uh, that water over them all. And uh, she realized that this was an indication, and so she wrote to Swami Vivekananda, who was then in South India, and told him, yes, my son, uh, this, is, this is all right, this is good, this is a good idea. So uh, these, uh, these devotees again raised the money in uh, in the Madras area, in the Chennai area, they again raised the money and they sent him, you know, they got passage for him from a ship in uh, Mumbai that was going to leave from Mumbai. And so they sent him on his way. And as he was about to get on his way, there came a telegram from the Maharaja of Khetri in Rajasthan that uh, he should come by and bless his house, bless his palace, his, his kingdom, uh, because he had just, uh, an heir to the throne had just been uh, born to him, and he, is, he considered Swami Vivekananda to be his guru, and he wanted his guru to bless his newborn son and bless the, the kingdom of Khetri. So Swami Vivekananda on, on his way to Mumbai stopped in Khetri and there another extraordinary thing happened. The reason this is all being mentioned is because this is an, an introduction to Swami Vivekananda in San Francisco. So it has, a, this is, this was a momentous event and, uh, so one by one, the things that led up to it, it's appropriate to mention. And what happened at the, in Khetri at that time, I mean, in a physical sense, it was very helpful to him because the Raja uh, sponsored him further, you know, the, it, it, the minimal amount of money that the Madras disciples had been able to Raise uh, would not have lasted very long in an expensive country like America in those days. So the Maharaja raised, uh, gave Swami Vivekananda additional funds and equipped him in various ways for this trip to the West. That is one thing. But the thing that uh, is, you know, was more significant was that one evening there was a, uh, an entertainment at the palace, as was customary. And there was a lady singer who uh, was going to perform. And uh, Swami Vivekananda was asked to be present at that performance to bless the occasion. But he said, no, it's not appropriate for me to be there, I'm a monk, I mean, this lady is going to sing, that's not appropriate for me to be there. So he was not going to go. But then the lady started to sing, and she was hurt by the fact that the Swami would not come to hear her songs and to bless her performance. Uh, so she sang this song, Oh, do not look upon my evil qualities. We are both the same Brahman. And the Swami heard that song. He had not, uh, he, he was in another room in another part of the palace, but he heard the song and it impressed him so much, realizing that he had been preaching the Vedanta for you know, all these years, but this uh, was a further deepening of his understanding that there is, there is that one reality and the fact that there's a difference on the surface 
The surface appearance is different. This lady was a singer who was not considered to be of a very high, uh, you know, not, not very complimentary ideas in those days. And also monks were not supposed to be attending such things. But she, out of her devotion, wanted to be blessed by this great monk and he had refused to meet her, so she expressed her disappointment in that way. Oh Lord, do not look upon my evil qualities. Make of us both the same Brahman. We are that reality. And uh, the Swami deeply felt that that was a message that was coming to him from a very profound source and uh, you could say was one of the things that was necessary for his mission in the West, that to see not the differences on the surface, but to see the reality, that the same reality is manifest in every manifestation. So those that, that prepared the Swami, you could say, for his... Uh, you know, for what he was to encounter, of course, in a totally different environment in uh, the United States at that time. Another thing which, uh, another profound factor in Swami Vivekananda's makeup was that during his wanderings, uh, he came... He went the whole length of India and finally he came to Kanyakumari. And at, the, at that location itself, there's a small island about maybe 400 yards off the coast, uh, separate from the mainland, but on it there's a temple to the Divine Mother. And uh, so right now there stands on that island a very large temple dedicated to Swami Vivekananda, which has been built, uh, which was f f quite recently built to memorialize the fact that he had had this profound spiritual understanding when he came to that place. And this also had to do a lot with the future of the work that uh, Sri Ramakrishna had entrusted to him but had not given him specific instructions in this respect. He sat on that rock uh, and he, looking back at India, slightly separated from India, it was an island off the coast, very tip of India, so the whole of India was in front of him. And he saw the spiritual greatness of the India, of the spiritual realm, the India that came from thousands of years before. And he also saw the problematic aspects of the present. And at that point, he, in his consciousness, there arose the idea that this monastic brotherhood which he had been uh, charged with establishing, uh, namely the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna and the coming disciples, their disciples, that they would go from place to place because he had seen that it, that spiritual greatness of India was fully intact but on the surface, the surface life needed a tremendous boost, tremendous assistance. So he turned the, uh, he, he saw it was necessary to turn this brotherhood of the monks of Sri Ramakrishna, who later became the Ramakrishna mission, to address the miseries of the present while being spiritually established in the glories of the past, physically addressing the miseries of the present. He saw that as the aim. 
So the the motto of the Ramakrishna mission, Atmano Moksartam Jagathitayacha, Atmano moksha, moksha for the moksha for the purpose of uh, realizing the freedom of the Atman, the, re, the reality of the Atman within, Jagathita, and for the welfare of the whole world, that those were the purposes of the Ramakrishna mission. And after that is when he uh, he went to Chennai, and there he, the disciples uh, gathered around him, and then urged him to go to Chicago. So he was that experience at Kanyakumari was, in a very real sense, a uh, profound uh, beginning on his universal mission. And uh, so, therefore, it's important to remember that. Now, uh, so the Swami came to Chicago, and of course the, uh, the tremendous success he had at the Parliament of Religions and all the details involved, uh, that those have been well described in a number of publications. But eventually uh, he came, he went back to India, and he, he was spent uh, also some time in England, uh, went back to India, he was in France for a little while, uh, there was a, a congress, a spiritual congress there that he briefly attended, and so forth. Anyway, he came back to India after, and then because the, the message of his great success at the Parliament of Religions uh, and elsewhere in America had been spread all over India when he landed, of course, in, uh, from Colombo, as they say, from Colombo to Almora, the uh, so many stops he made, so much. I mean, it was a continual uh, progress of uh, one great enthusiastic reception after another. He became a tremendous personality uh, in India, and he established the Ramakrishna Mission. Then, uh, because his own health was failing, his brother disciples suggested that he again go to the West uh, in order to recover his health. So he did come here the second time, and eventually he came to California. So this is now the actual subject of this uh, of this morning. But in order to put the subject in context, uh, it is very helpful to remember the greatness of some of these other events to show who Shri Swami Vivekananda was and where his uh, great his inspiration came from. So uh, the second time he came to uh, to the West, eventually there came a reason for him to come to California. One of his uh, disciples, uh, her brother was very ill. She had to go to California. So Swami Vivekananda said, if, if you find people are interested in hearing the things, these spiritual things, these spiritual uh, principles and uh, discourses, uh, get up some classes, and then I will come. So he came, and in uh, 1899, December 1899, he went. He uh, came to Los Angeles and gave quite a number of lectures and classes and influenced a large number of devotees. And uh, one of them said, Swami, I think if you went to San Francisco, uh, people there would be much impressed by you. So he just said, yes, go, we will go. And uh, also uh, there had been a sort of a small local parliament of religions 
uh, on a very small scale, but nevertheless for the locality, very significant, uh, established in uh, First Unitarian Church of Oakland, the minister, Benjamin Fame Mills, uh, sponsored it. I think he had been at the Parliament of Religions and had seen Swami Vivekananda there. And knowing that he was in California, he had invited him to come. So he came to San Francisco. He came actually to San Francisco uh, and uh, gave a lecture here in San Francisco before the parliament, uh, this this uh, small parliament of religions organized in Oakland started, had uh, gave altogether, I think, about eight lectures uh, to large crowds of people, uh, a thousand people, 1,500 people. The church was totally filled. His fame had preceded him. Anyway, then he came to uh, San Francisco in the course of this. Uh, I mean, he actually he had uh, been established in uh, a place called the Home of Truth, which was a new thought movement in those days. Who were people who were very much uh, interested in Eastern religions and appreciated the Swami greatly. There were two homes of truth in San Francisco, and one in Alameda, and he stayed at, uh, at times at all three of them. Had a tremendous uh, success, had some uh, rented a flat on Turk Street in which he would, uh, he could then welcome a few earnest disciples and teach them. Uh, in a less formal setting than in, a, than in a, a church would have been. Anyway, stayed here for a number of months. Uh, he, uh, before he left, he spent uh, over two weeks in a camp at Samuel Taylor State Park in uh, Marin County. The place is now called the Irving Picnic Area. And uh, we have wanted to put a plaque there to memorialize that spot, but have not been able to get permission to do so. But anyway, the place can be visited. There's a parking lot there. And uh, in the year 2000, which was the 100th anniversary of uh, Swami Vivekananda's coming to that area, he, uh, we, we had a, a, a program there uh, and uh, conjunction with our retreat in Olima. And, and one of the reasons for the retreat in Olima, which was purchased uh, by under Swami Ashokananda when he was in charge of the Vedanta Society. One of the reasons for choosing uh, the property at Olima was that it was quite close to Samuel Taylor State Park. In fact, one has to go past the park in the shortest route to the retreat. One comes, one passes the park, and each time we do so, we remember Swami Vivekananda's presence there for over two weeks in which he, uh, he camped and uh, you know, taught and walked and you know, recovered his strength uh, in that summer of 1900. So this is the uh, you know this is the the basic idea. But one of the uh, what what we also want to see is what exactly he taught here. And one of the impressions that have uh, ha remarks have been made was that in San Francisco, actually, the when he left San Francisco after that. Basically, he did not lecture significantly after that uh, because he uh, 
a, a few lectures he gave in New York, and then uh, he went back to India. In India, he took his mother on a pilgrimage, and uh, so he gave a few talks like this, but they were more, uh, they were not as, uh, you could say, as uh, well known, and he did not uh, stress things in the same way that he stressed uh, things in, in his earlier work in the United States and in California. So and they were more or less like a, an after effect rather than part of his main, you could say, his main spiritual campaign. So in effect, one could say that most of the uh, influential lectures that he gave, basically the ones he gave in the San Francisco Bay Area, that means San Francisco, Alameda, Oakland, uh, were after those he had given in the Los Angeles, Pasadena area, that those series of lectures that he given in California were, uh, you could say, the uh, the summing up of what he had to give to the world. Now, the, uh, the certain things he emphasized, and uh, one of the uh, estimates of his, you know, what he was trying to teach people was that uh, really in California, in a sense, he knew that this was, you could say, his last major uh, push or his last major effort in this, what is it that he felt was the essence of the message that he had to give. And we could summarize it briefly, of course, in, uh, to really understand, you have to read the lecture yourself. It's a very long lecture. And also you have to read the other lectures uh, that he has given in, in various other places. You have to read it, some of them to become familiar with the trend of his thought, with what he was trying to establish. And also <clears throat> to some of the letters he wrote, especially there's one letter which he wrote on uh, April 18th, 1900, to uh, 1900, you can read it in the complete works, uh, is really a remarkable statement that uh, describes his personality and his being uh, as he approached that final harbor, which we all of us have to sooner or later approach. And uh, But now, going back to that uh, lecture, what it is Vedanta, the future religion, People were so enthusiastic about his teaching that uh, the very subject, I mean, normally this very subject is Vedanta, the future religion would never have come up to, if uh, the lecturer, lecturer had been uh, casually talking about uh, explaining his faith to people. Uh, it would never have come up, but because his lectures were so powerful and so influential and the people who were moved by them to transform their own lives in that image felt that this was something really that Vedanta was really a fundamental uh, restating of this ancient quest and it uh, resolved their own doubts and problems and attitudes and future program so successfully. This idea came up, well, this could be the religion of the future. And Swami Vivekananda said, well, he doesn't know. I don't know if he'll be, if it'll be the religion of the future. It may be the religion of a few people who can understand this 
a very uh, astute approach. So the point is, he said, well, I don't know if he'll be the religion of the, you know, a large number of people, but let me tell you the essence. What is the essence? And then you can judge for yourself if this religion is significant. First of all, he said, what is it that makes religion great? It's a... The first thing that makes religion great is it has to have a book. Uh, many religions don't have books, I mean, uh, and so the point, what the point he was making was that the religions that have books have survived for thousands of years and mainly on the basis of that book. Other religions have arisen and uh, spiritual, let's not call them religion, spiritual movements have arisen and then have passed away after some time because there was nothing, no central core. And uh, the central core uh, usually is a book. And he said, first of all, Vedanta does not have a book. Now, it does have a, many books, namely the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and other spiritual uh, treatises are there. But none of them are considered as a sine qua non. That means if you eliminate the book, uh, the religion itself falls to the ground. And uh, so Vedanta is not like that. His statement was that Vedanta is the points to the inner truth, the inner reality. The book is only a signpost along the way. That inner truth, that inner reality does not require the book. We may require the book as a signpost, but the spiritual uh, spirituality that is pointed out by Vedanta is not dependent upon the book in any sense because it's it's the truth that's inherent inside every living being and every phenomenon every also non-living reality at the core of that this is Vedanta points to that 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 is the reality not the description of it so that is the first thing. The second thing that a religion needs <coughs> to be, again, the question is, is the Vedanta the future religion? Uh, generally, the religions have to have a person, veneration for a person. Now, uh, there are each of the major religions of the world, uh, its veneration for a personality is central to its uh, to its existence. <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, but v uh, Vedanta does not really have any person. I mean, it has holy people, it has many sages and many saints that are exemplars of, for us, like, people who have established uh, a, who have a, a strong, uh, devo a strong devotion to this particular faith, and the the results that they have achieved, they are exemplars of that. And uh, there are people who have achieved that. Great teachers have come, and uh, they, but they are not considered as the sine qua non, as that which cannot be. Uh, done without that even if there were no spiritual uh, spiritual luminaries for us to focus on the point is that luminosity is within and that is what is emphasized these uh, spiritual teachers uh, explain to us the successes that they've had the struggles that they've had and using them as an example, we ourselves follow their guidance. But the light that they point to has nothing to do with any particular manifestation. 
It is the essence, the reality of what is. The, what is at the heart of all of reality? It is what is at the core of every perception, at the core of every thought. That is the, uh, what is being pointed to, and the people who point to it are seen as saints and sages. But the, rea the point is we should never uh, de deflect our attention from the actual light that is illumining the hearts of everything and everyone that these great sages point to. It's not the sages that are crucial, it's the light itself. And that remains even if there were no sages to point to it. So that's the second thing that Vedanta does not have. It does not have the exclusive reliance upon any particular book, even though it emphasizes uh, books as guides, but the book itself is not the source of inspiration. And then the same with the person. Now, then the third aspect that makes a uh, religion uh, very popular and very uh, much adhered to is exclusivity, that this religion contains the truth and other religions just contain either less of the truth or something which is not considered to be particularly true at all. So that is the point, that the, each, that religion itself is not what contains the truth. The heart of each being contains the truth. The heart of each being has that reality within. And so it is not any, all of the religions are point, point to that same ultimate goal, and it isn't that one of them is going to get you there and the others won't. Ekam sat vipra bahudha vadanti, that truth is one, and uh, sages vipra, the sages uh, Bahudha in various ways, Vadanti describe it in various ways, and each of the descriptions is a form of religion. So exclusivity is not is also not uh, present. So this was anyway. This gives you a short idea, a short you could say, introduction into that uh, particular lecture, Is Vedanta the Future Religion? Uh, and uh, so it is just to say that while San Francisco was the source, you know, of was the place where that lecture was delivered, it was, in a sense, in San Francisco that he summarized in these lectures, summarized what he had said earlier, uh, and uh, therefore and his presence in this city and his actually having founded this Vedanta Society, these are the things that we remember as inspirations, but the inspiration they point to is the truth within each one of us, the reality within each one of us, which does not need any book, does not need any teacher. The teachers and the books make it available, make it more accessible. And that is there, that is an extremely glorious and wonderful function. But we have to remember that that truth is within our hearts. And even if all of the aids were, were not present, that same truth would be there all, all the same. And eventually it is, it has to become self-evident, not needing, ultimately not needing any intermediary because it's the very heart of our own realization. Within me is that infinite light. Within me is that source of wisdom. Within me is, is everything that is 
necessary to be reached, that is important to be reached within me is that which is immortal and unchanging. Because this universe consists of two things, that which changes and that which does not change. Everything that changes is supported, is bounded by a reality that does not change, cannot change, is infinite, eternal. And that is at the heart of everything, beyond all possibility of any contradiction or any uh, negativity that is at the very source of our being. And these, this thought, this attitude, this, uh, the aim, this uh, expression of the aim of religion is what Swami Vivekananda especially emphasized in California and in Northern California here. Uh, so this is what we are remembering this morning. Om Dyao Shanti Antariksham Shanti Prithivi Shanti Apo Shanti Roshadaya Shanti Vanaspataya Shanti Visvedeva Shanti Brahma Shanti Sarvam Shanti Shanti Reva Shanti Same Shanti Redi Om Shanti Shanti Shanti